welcome to Manufacturing Day. Interna Woo! Is it American Manufacturing? International yeah. Manufacturing. No, it's just Manufacturing Day. Amer Global, but manufacturing Day uh, here in New York City. We're at Adafruit, where we manufacture. It's me, Lady Ada, the engineer, and with me is Megan Smith, Hello. CTO of the United States of America, Hello. and Megan Brewster, who's in charge of advanced manufacturing for the White House. Okay. Uh, there are special guests here today as we celebrate manufacturing by doing what we do best, manufacturing. We wanted to come and see you, so tell us more. Absolutely. So uh, what we do here is electronics manufacture. So you know, you open up your phone or your GPS, the circuitry inside there, that's the kind of stuff we make. Now a lot of companies outsource this stuff uh, overseas, but we're really interested in doing that kind of manufacturing here in the US. And it's actually perfect because we can do very fast manufacturing, quick turnaround times, uh, less confusion, the quality is really high, and we can do that because you know we've got this great manufacturing space here in New York. I do the designing here, we do our videos here. It's very tight knit, and we can do that because we're doing onshore American manufacturing. Let's like check we're out. Here, let's check out this. This is cool. Yeah, this is our pick and place machine. So this is what does like the majority of the work in placing components on a circuit board. So when you get a circuit board. And uh, one second, I'll, I'll grab So can one. you guys see this? So basically, look at all these parts here. They got all the parts, and then they're going fed up there, and see the little machine comes and grabs whatever yeah. it needs and puts it right on the board. Yeah, those are those so are pick nozzle. and place. Picking and placing. So the circuit board, this is what it's making right now. So the circuit board, actually, we have uh, like 10 by 3, so 30 products on one panel. Right. It's more efficient. So we panelize it, and this is a, a printed circuit board with copper traces on it. And all these components, are placed by this machine and the faster it can do it the faster we can do the manufacturing right. and each of these is a single product so each That's of these right. can be unique independent they can but uh to make the manufacturing efficient it's best to do a large run of like one one product because you have to load up all these reels so each one of these reels has one component on it and this has about like 20 or 30 components per design so to make it the most You'll efficient you want to do a batch, you kind yeah, of like right. do, you, you know, do it all at once. Same as clothing fabrication. So it's just sort of putting stuff into batch processing. Yeah, and this is, this is the best batch processor you can get. So this is a machine and, you, and it has this awesome vision recognition. So when it picks up the component, you see that white flash of LED? It's actually taking a photo of the underneath and making sure it's the right part and it's twisting it so it's perfectly aligned. It can do like 0.01 inch, 0.01 millimeter precision. Uh, placement like super super precise so you can have extremely dense electronics which is what you need for electronics these days and then before it goes to this machine it goes over here to the stencil printer so this is the stencil printer and this is a stencil so if you guys have ever made um, like seen like t-shirt manufacturer where sure. they have a stencil and they squeegee ink yeah. onto a t-shirt that's how t-shirts are made this is kind of the same thing but with metal so this is a stainless steel stencil um, and these are also made in the U.S. These are made in New Jersey by Met Stencil for us. And there's a nice frame and then this nice stiff stainless steel. And then you can see you hear that? these little, yeah, it's super, it's super tight. So it's slightly flexible, so there's a little bit of give, but it also won't stretch at all. And right, there's laser cut, yeah, there's laser cut holes. And so uh, it squeegees this liquid metal onto there to, um, Every, every point where the components touch the circuit board, there's a little bit of this metallic glue, basically, that um, keeps the part in place, and then it gets melted and on. And then you pop right. it on and heat it. Yeah, and the nice thing about that solder paste, which is what gets squeegeed here, is it's a little sticky. And so after the pick and place pops the part on, you can actually lift it and, and move it, and the part doesn't slip, it sticks in place. One of the things that I really like is to make sure the children are exposed to this stuff, you know, just like we have great expectations that children will learn to write an essay by the time they're in high school, you know, they start with the letters, they start there, same kind of thing here. You know, maybe they're in, in pre-K or kindergarten, they're doing little things with beads and glue. This is the same idea. You know, it's much more precise, of course, but the idea of squeegeeing your t-shirt with the, you know, squeegee this with the solder paste and then pick and place it on. It's the same kind of thing, but think, you know, apprentice, journeyman, master, These are totally have like the Perlo children beads, do this. Yes. But electronics. Yes. Uh, and that's how all the electronics are manufactured. So this is how everything you have that's electronic, TVs or your cell phone, your like video game player, all of that stuff is made in the same way. So 
uh, if you opened it up, you would see the same kind of circuit board and the same kind of process that occurs. Chips that are kind of usually the brain, and then some way usually to plug in yeah. power so or you can input see, output. This is the micro USB, yeah. so this is how you would power it or program it. So these are all like familiar components, but we just get them 5,000 at a time. Yeah. So after um, the pick and place and the stenciling, this gets ovened and that melts the paste on. And so yeah. this has been ovened so I can, I can safely do this and the yeah. parts don't come off. And then the next part is we do um, test and packaging. Uh -huh. So over here, we can see, for example, hey, Samantha. Hello. Hey, Sam. Hi. So Sam is one of our technicians here. Um, and right now she's doing some hand soldering. So once in a while there's a component that can't be pick and placed mm -hmm. because uh, it's too large or it has, the holes have to go through the board. And right. so what she's doing is um, she's carefully soldering each one in place and then uh, to finish the design, that's done after the pick and place. That's not unusual to have a little bit of hand work. You wanna minimize that. Sometimes you can't quite avoid it. Yeah. Like let's say you have um, a screen, the screen, display part can't go through the oven it would melt I mean the oven gets to 240 degrees right, Celsius right. so it's, it's hot so uh, you can't you can only put stuff in that's ceramic or metal or silicon something that can withstand that heat anything else you have to hand solder the other thing that's important here is she's wearing glasses and you can also see she's got a little yeah, uh, suction fan yeah, yeah that's good exhaust so that any of the the fumes that come off the solder are going to go out this way. All right, we're going to we're going to hire you as a production manager here. Uh, so Mick here is testing um, all of the boards. So after the boards are uh, pick and placed, uh, soldered, um, any hand soldering is done, uh, we actually do the test and programming. So we have uh, work orders and test procedures for each board, so that. Um, we check to make sure, I mean, we have 99% of the products are fine, but we still don't want to have even 1% exactly. go out. Because even with all this fine precision, the paste might be a little bit dry, or maybe the oven wasn't completely hot enough. There's always some variation. And part of manufacturing is knowing how to um, get your processes down, like really solid, right. because you want to have yeah. the best yield and the best quality to make mixed jobs a lot easier, to make Sam's job a lot easier. So. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, out of these, probably one of the boards won't work. We'll identify that, we'll look what happened to the board. Uh, was there a little bit of too much paste, too little? Yep. Um, we'll go back and adjust our processes, maybe change a setting or tweak something, or, um, or repair it here in house and then get it packaged up. Yeah, so it's really important to notice that not only are you designing a product, but also you're designing the process. And also in this case, this is a product itself. There's mm -hmm. not that many of them, but it's, it's sort of the test jig that you're putting things onto. So right now, what do you do? You're verifying flash, so you're wiping the flash, the memory. Checking USB. And then adding a new program. And it has and instructions. Yeah, this is a standalone is tester, standalone. which is good, so you don't have a computer. So um, the way this works is you have the board, so it looks, you can see there's a headphone jack, a microcontroller, and a USB, and this is an audio board. So actually what this board does, this is very popular for Halloween, this is probably what we're making them. Halloween. It's a little board that allows you to add sound effects to anything. When you plug it into your computer, it looks like a USB key, and you yeah. drag audio files on, and so then you, you want to have the glasses awesome. zoom around and sing. Yeah, and like make sound, or like good. make zappy noises, and then there's pin outs on either side, and when you connect them with a button, it will make a sound effect. Cool. So these are really popular for cosplay, costumes, and then this is the tester. And so there's you mount it onto the jig. Yeah. And that. it's got and these little wings. Sure there, put the wings on. Yeah. Yeah. And then you plug it in and then you press the button to start testing. And it goes through the test procedure and it gives you a little readout. And so this is a product in itself that the manufacturing team are creating and then using mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. There's more than just awesome. making the product. You have to make the test procedure. And this is actually one of the toughest parts. If you make a good test procedure, everybody's job is easy. If you don't have a really good test procedure, you have quality problems. You have frustrated workers. Everybody gets kind of sad. So it's really important to have a good test procedure. And each tester has these pogo pins, which are really neat. You can put your fingers on this. These are little squidgy springs. And so when you press awesome. it down, it makes good contact right. with the pads underneath. And that's how we design um, the tester so that you can, you don't have to permanently attach it. You just kind of push it down and it goes through the test procedure. Cool. Now Thank you. Know, you. Just, Thanks, no man. This is what we first start out with. We just right. your prototype. We prototype what will the tester, become the jig. and it's kind of like got these little wires everywhere, and it works, but it's just not sturdy for long-term use. So once yep. we verify the tester design, then we'll actually go back and yeah, make that final product, which is the tester, and that's what Alicia um, does. She designs it using CAD software, 
Yeah, this is, it's not actually that complicated. I mean, it's a complicated design, <laughs> but we're not designing a whole motherboard, yeah. but we still want to do a very good job. And then what we can do is use this machine called an other mill to prototype it. Um, so here's an other mill board. So uh, this machine is manufactured in San Francisco by our friend uh, Danielle Applestone. So she's, in, she's on the other coast making machines that make machines. Okay. Did uh, you guys see the little drill bit? See, oh, it's just yeah, like a little a, drill right there, a milling. It's for milling right here. Yeah, it comes out and it can, the, the little can bit cut. comes in and it very precise, it's really loud, so I'm not going to turn it on. Yeah. But it comes in, it can cut precise traces. So it's almost the opposite of like a 3D printer. It's a removal right. yeah. part of it. And so we get these copper sheets and it cuts out each trace. And you can like get a that. sense in the yeah. picture, like if you want to design it, yeah. you know, how, how you might want the different channels to go and yeah. then you put the part and then it in cuts it out and this is so precise it can it can cut one one hundredth of an inch little drill bits it takes a while but it can do it and then we use this tool to help us try out like is this going to work before we send something out to manufacturers this is part of our, our prototyping tools right so we like to mix it up we have a lot of, we have really big machines that make a yeah. lot and a machine that makes one right because you need a prototype yeah. and then eventually you're going to design the full production jet test jig. Yeah, and so that's how that's how we we make stuff. Very here. cool. Hello, Carlo. Yeah. So um, Carlo is showing off uh, the the final final step that we have after we do the manufacturing, like essentially the manufacturing, the picking plates, and the ovening, the testing, the jigging. Look at that. <laughs> we finally package it for sale, um, and this is the final step. And this, the, this is a, a special kind of packaging to protect it from... Yeah, this is anti-static. It, it looks cool. You know when you like shock people? Yeah, we don't want to shock the electronics, so... Get your hair. It comes in a nice um, anti-static bag, and it comes with any extra parts that it needs. So this is, you know, the circuit board that was pick and placed probably only a couple days ago, and now it's in this bag. And each bag has a barcode for the product. Um, and it also, so this is the part number, the, the part number 2327, and that's what we use for shipping. And then this is the work order number. So we have batch tracking, which is mm -hmm. something that you have to deal with as you get into more high scale manufacturing. You can't just make something. You have to know when was it made, mm -hmm. what parts were used. And um, if you really, there's an issue, you might need to recall it, all kinds right. of things. You might want to talk to the people who brought, bought it so mm -hmm. you want to track it. So we know all the components that are used here, where we bought them from. It's very, very rare, but once in a while we'll get a bad batch of chips or um, something got swapped or there was an inventory mistake. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, we want to know what customers got so we can contact them and say, hey, uh, we know that, you, you know, you may have gotten uh, one of these bad boards, please check this, we'll send you a, ret a re return or refund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very rare, but you want to be prepared for that if it doesn't happen so that you can track um, what you're making. I mean, it, it, as you get into very expensive equipment, you absolutely have to do it, but we're doing it even for $5 That's circuit terrific. boards as practice to get better at our processes. Yeah, manufacturing has notoriously long and complex su supply chains, and yeah. it's awesome that you guys know not just exactly where you got it from, you also know the names of your suppliers. I mean, this is great. You, oh, you, you never know. I mean, like, it, it, we can buy a reel, and six months later, a reel of components, and use it six months later, and it turns out that there, somebody else, you know, made a swap or a mistake, or maybe it's it's rotated. Mm -hmm. it, it's very rare, but when it does happen, you want to be able to take care of it immediately. And we've definitely seen some manufacturing companies or people who do, and this is something that happens a lot with outsourced manufacturing. There's no way to control for that. Mm -hmm. When you do in-house manufacturing, when you do it in the U.S., you can have much more stringent controls and quality assurance checks. Um, I've seen people who've outsourced manufacturing, and you know, they had, there was one mistake made somewhere early in the chain and they ended up with 10,000 bad mm -hmm. products that need to be hand fixed. And, and they'll fix them, but now the company is out of money because they had to so sit down costly. and fix it. It's so costly to do so. Um, so, you know, fast turn, QC processes, testing at every step. After we manufacture the first panel of every design, we go through that test procedure before we manufacture five or 10,000. Oh. And do people trade jobs a lot? How does it work for the team? Like Absolutely. Um, we have people change around. So Carlo will do sometimes test, and we'll have Will sometimes on machines and sometimes on inventory. Um, Vance does rework a lot. Uh, hey, Vance. Run over. Hey. hey. So have, Vance happy is. Happy manufacturing day. Hey, happy Woo! manufacturing day. So <laughs> let's go over here and see. Let's see. This is this is the this is a little bit sad, but it does happen once in a while. We have to do rework, and uh -huh. rework is the repair part. We'll, we'll analyze, you know, does it make sense, you know, like how much time we're spending versus the components. We try as much as possible to, to fix it so we don't have 
more stuff going into landfills. So Vance uses tools like the hot air gun, which is extremely hot, so be careful, and um, can heat up the parts like a little mini hot air yes. oven area yeah. and um, push the part in or push it around to get it to make good contact. So right now he's going through a reject collection and uh -huh. fixing them. So How's it going? So far, so good. And he's great at it. You love it. Uh, and Damon's over here. Hey, Damon. Hello. Hello. Uh, Damon works um, a lot with uh, testing and also production management and scheduling. Um, so he works with Atira and they're basically our production scheduling team. And so they do the very uh, unenviable job of making sure things happen when they're supposed to happen. Thank you. Nice. Um, because otherwise, you know, he's, he's basically the, what's the traffic cop? Can I say that? Traffic cop or... Uh, you know, like in Alice in Wonderland, you're like, well, hey, let's go. Let's you're, go. you're the white rabbit, <laughs> the white rabbit. Of, um, of Adafruit. So you yeah. just make sure that we get all the components in on time and they're the right thing. And, yeah. and that what would we need to make? Like, let's say we have a distributor right. come in and order 500 of something. Well, unexpected. We're not going to say no to that business. Right. We're always going to say yes to the business, but we have to schedule that in. Right. And we have to make things sure. things have to come from all over the mm -hmm. place. And so if you're just waiting for a part, it's just time is money. So it's just sitting and sitting and That's waiting. right. They're waiting and it's not so going to be a critical, critical So when do we expedite? Job. When do we tell the customer it's going to take longer? Sometimes we have multiple assemblies where one department will make one right. thing, another department will make another. Coordinating with them. So there isn't like, hey, I thought you were supposed to give me 500 right. of those today. Right. No, that's next week. Right. Ah, ah. And so the U.S. is such a pioneer of just-in-time manufacturing. Yep. And so this is kind of continuing that this great legacy. This is super just-in-time. I mean, we're talking, we'll get an order in the morning from a customer, a quote request for 500. Within two hours, we'll get them the lead time. And, and if they book the order, we'll probably be getting it into manufacturing two days and get the order out within a week. Uh, again, you cannot do this if you're doing offshore manufacturer, right. not possible. It's six to eight weeks minimum. Even right. to get an answer takes right. a week or two, but here, because our team is so good at this and we have all the information, um, we can be very fast, very responsive, and and you know we don't have to expedite things and, and ship everything around and worry about, like, oh, we, is this gonna affect our quality? Is this gonna affect our, our holiday sales? Um, we have all the software control. written to take care yeah. of it. Terrific. So, yeah. yeah. So going back to your workforce and the folks doing all of these amazing jobs, what is their training? What do they study and at what level? If someone wants to come work for Adafruit, That's what do they That's an excellent to do? question. Um, we actually hire people uh, just who have um, attention to detail and, and care about what they're doing. We don't look for you had to graduate from this school or you had to have this experience. Um, you know, we love it when somebody comes here and says, oh, you know, I." I really love fixing bicycles because right. we're like, yeah. okay, you know how to like do mechanical stuff and get use parts and use your hands yeah. and, and look at like why is the brake line not working? Well, uh -huh. maybe it's the brake line, but maybe it's something else that's causing that. So debugging that. and really having the patience to keep looking mm -hmm. until you can find the problem, the real problem. And you don't have to have a you know computer science degree to do that. This is a, it's just stuff that a lot of people have if you you know work on your car mm -hmm. or, or fix bicycles or even if you like to um, sew and make. Um, patterns and do costuming. These are kind of skills that you may already have. So it's not like this is unavailable for uh, manufacturing is unavailable for people who no. haven't gone to MIT. That's not necessary. Um, everybody loves to do stuff with their hands. Right. Like so you, you can come in and you begin somewhere and then you can move around. I love that you rotate stations and and have that opportunity. Yeah, we have people who come here everything. and they've never soldered before. We have soldering workshops every few weeks. And but because they have that curiosity and that drive to learn and they're not scared of working with their hands, they can learn these skills. Yeah, you have to be willing to get your hands a little dirty, but as long as, as long as you're comfortable, sometimes you have to experiment and learn. And you know, it's funny, like we have these machines and you think like, well, with the machines, it's, it's so automated, but you still have to have a very fine hand to understand what's going on in the machine, how is it thinking. Uh -huh. you, know, you have to program the machine. Yeah. You do, do have to program it. Yeah, and you have to tweak it. Yeah. So even if you follow the program, uh, you might have to kind yeah, of bring your own you sure. uh, little experience to it. So that that's kind of how we do all the manufacturing. And this is all a team. Everybody here works together. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks. All right, so that's, that's Adafruit Manufacturing. Yay. Thank Yay. you so much. So, actually, one more thing I want okay. to know is uh, you started this in your dorm room yeah. when you were in school. Yeah. And so your first products, it sounds like, like these kits, just a yeah. couple kits. And now... Say a little it's bit about about Adafruit. Adafruit. How many people work here? Yeah, oh, right. we're here in the middle. That's right. Of what are we doing here? Yeah, <laughs> that's so exciting. Let's explain why we're here. Um, so Adafruit started in 2005. Yep. 
Uh, and I was a student at MIT, and I really didn't want to work on my thesis. So instead, <laughs> I really didn't want to work so on it. So it's a procrastination project. No, but it worked out. <laughs> uh, instead, what I did was I built my own uh, little Game Boy type uh, uh, game playing thing, or built my own MP3 player, or built a synthesizer. And these were the th things I did for fun, because I had been studying engineering, and you know, uh, you, we are all from MIT, so we all know there's a lot of like calculus and physics and like differential analysis and like you, you do all this really hard math and 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 bless it I love that hard math it's great and uh, it was very enjoyable to go through that but I wanted to do stuff with my hands I'm an engineer right. yeah like yeah. I'm an electrical engineer I wanted electrical engineer well one of the challenges that we have uh, in school is that a lot of times we're, we're teaching children a lot of facts of yeah. math and science and we want to do that we need to do that as engineers you want to uh, know that. In fact, I love that the Canadian engineers get a ring when oh, they yeah. graduate that's from a bridge that fell down. And so making sure they're keeping the responsibility of knowing the facts and doing their best job uh, that they could do. But but it's it's really important for a country that people get to play mm -hmm. with the engineering, get to sort of do science fair discovery or, you know, sort of making. Yeah, as the so amateur. Trying to add that in, especially well, freshman okay. college as mm -hmm. well as kindergarten. So that you don't have to wait till senior year of college till you get to like do it or till you graduate. And so yeah, it sounds now like you the, were thinking a lot of that for yourself. Absolutely. And then use the instruction to sell yourself forward. Yeah, we have like first robotics, and so a lot of which I didn't have as a kid. A lot of a lot of students now have the opportunity yeah, in high Legos, school. The Lego yeah, Lego yeah. and robots, yeah. and there's the maker community. Uh -huh. So and now you guys are making these kits that people can do for you said for Halloween. And yeah, for so like I'm wearing some of you know we're wearing some of our, our, our fashionable wearable electronics. So what we're trying to do is is take these advanced electronic components that would normally be. Some of them are like actually space age technologies, like gyroscopes and accelerometers. And take the accelerometer that was designed for NASA, and now it's so low cost that we can embed it in a skirt that when you dance, it twinkles along with your movement. Uh -huh. And I think that's awesome to show people. Or like your skateboard. Or skateboard yeah, light up, or yeah, yeah, or like, you know, take measurements of how much G force your knees are handling right. when you, you know, do an Ollie or whatever. And uh, showing people that the technology that's around them isn't just enclosed in these phones or computers or TVs. They can build this stuff themselves. They can experiment and have fun and be creative using technology. That's what I would have loved to do at school instead of just math, which I love. But, um, I but love maybe the creativity. do it and then learn the math, almost like PE. You know, mm -hmm. you go and play baseball or basketball, and then you get some instruction. You play, you get some instruction. So trying exactly. to new to a science of math to be taught that way. You know, like inside of our board, inside of our cell phones are these. It's kinds all the of stuff. Boards. It's the all other, the stuff. The other thing that's really great that uh, your company and the other Internet of Things type companies are doing a little bit of work with as well is uh, sensors. So you know, sensors and being able to see what's around us, you know, sort of test, testing not only temperature, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, you know, using it like a Geiger counter, you know, can we plug this stuff in our phones or have that? It's really fun for kids to, as they learn, say, earth sciences, mm -hmm. be able to go outside into the, and recess and really test the playground for what's there. Yeah, and there was actually a really cool project that uh, some friends of ours did um, after the Fukushima disaster in mm -hmm. Japan, where they, they created basically an internet of Geiger counters where they, you know, got off the shelf of Geiger counters and connected them to the internet and so they could actually plot and see, you know, how safe are mm -hmm. areas and, and what are the radiation levels. We also see people doing that with air quality yeah, air in quality, their towns soil, yeah. or soil water moisture. quality. Yeah, or people doing gardening projects mm -hmm. where they want to, you know, the, the little bit uh, more fun is you have a greenhouse and they can actually automate the greenhouse to tell them when do I need to uh, adjust the pH of the yeah. soil or get more water. Yeah. All of these sensors that used to be like mm -hmm. only for the most high-end advanced right. engineers you can now get us uh, you know soil most soil moisture sensor for like 20 right. or 30 dollars exactly. right. bring it down to everybody democratize so that manufacturing yeah and enable the citizen scientists yeah citizen science yeah. So, yeah citizen engineering yeah. Yeah. so that's what we're that's what we're into and citizen I, making so in the same it's yes. sort of in the same way of I'll be interviewing someone who uh, long career at IBM she's an amazing uh, reached the highest level of techn technical leaders there. You know, and the computers they used to have were, you know, huge, and then they slowly got smaller until they're like, you know, as big as your phone. And the same thing is happening now with microelectronics and this whole world, which yeah. is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, like, I, in 10 years, it's changed so much, and it's so awesome how easy it is now. Um, you know, we have a, a weekly show and tell where we have people from all over the world come on a, a video hangout online, mm -hmm. and they show off the projects, and so we get to see um, you know, young girls with their Girl Scout troops making robots, 
and um, grandmothers who are embroidering coats with LEDs, mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, fathers and sons working on projects to like make a cool hovercraft bed. I mean, like every kind of project, right. and people working together and not being scared of engineering and electronics, right. realizing that hey, this is this is just like an art form. It, it, you know, if I can learn how to cook, I can learn how to do electronics, right. exactly. and just just knowing how to make yourself dinner doesn't mean you have to go to engineering school exactly. if you want to. You, know, you sorry. can go later. You can yeah, start you go later. later. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then you can also go online. You can go in code boot camps, oh, uh, yeah. which are great. They're all over the country. Yes. There's tech meetups. So, if you look up, if you go meet up and you look up your zip code, you can find meetups in your area where people like this Maker are getting spaces, together. Makerspaces, makerspaces, and maybe spaces. you don't know how to do it, but if you just go, it's a very welcoming community. We have hundreds of meetups a day, tech meetups a day That's across so cool. America. Makerspaces, startup weekends. Yeah, there was New York Maker Fair mm -hmm. here. There's one in, in San Francisco. There's actually a Maker Fair now in, in like 500 different cities. Yeah, um, it was just awesome, and people just being positive, showing off what they're doing, and all sorts of different kind of creativity. And I think. I think it has created a resurgence of people who want to do manufacturing engineering mm -hmm. here in the United States. Um, it's, it's worked so well. I, and I love it, like we've been doing this for 10 years now, yes. since 2005. We now go to these events and, and we meet kids. We actually don't recognize them because they're adults now. Right. And they said, awesome. yeah, when I was 12, I, was, you know, I did a kit or I followed one of your tutorials online or watched some videos. And now I'm graduating from Caltech. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, like, so that's awesome amazing! That's so, awesome. <laughs> so with this morning we were over at Industry City, which is a, a huge space. They put together all kinds of manufacturing in Brooklyn. And so it's great to see New York City uh, and the moves they're making. Also the mayor just announced that computer science, uh, he's making a push for computer science and coding to be available to all the young people and, and all the kids in their schools here. There's several other Miami Day and others have made that commitment. And so not only the coding side, but the manufacturing and the making side and really getting American manufacturing in these jobs. In our country, we have five million jobs open in the United States right now. Half a million of them are in the tech coding area and some of them in these kinds of spaces. And we really need Americans to feel like hey, that's for me, you know, we want supply and demand to work. And so the work that you guys are doing to make it accessible is terrific. So thank you Yay. for the thank tour so today. Much. Well, thank you for visiting. I'm glad that we got to celebrate this manufacturing day by doing some manufacturing. I'm going to put you on the testers and I'm going to have you on packaging. For okay. No, just, Deal. We're in. Yeah. Okay. I'm ready. Thanks everybody for watching this video. Uh, we're here from Adafruit and we're doing manufacturing today. And maybe you want to be a manufacturer or maybe you're interested in engineering or coding, what website can they go to to learn more? Manufacturingday.com, so mfgday.com. mfgday.com? Just put in your zip code, you'll be able to find all kinds of factories that have opened their doors to tours right in your neighborhood. So that sounds awesome. Come on I'm, in. I'm gonna go and do that. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. you. Bye.